Okay, so this is a talk about managing stress in the moment. So how children use vocal behaviors uh, for both self-regulation and dysregulation at home. Okay, so self-regulation is really important. So of all of the things that when we measure it during infancy, and we look at how predictive that is of long-term psychopathology, so how likely they are to have a mental health disorder during later life, self-regulation is actually the thing that comes out as most predictive of later psychopathology. Um, so what is it? So how are we measuring it? So uh, most of the studies in, a lot of the studies in that paper, um, and a lot, most of the studies generally measure self-regulation using this type of paradigm. Uh, so we give a baseline assessment. So we so we bring a child into the lab and uh, we sit, sit them in a chair. Uh, we give them a baseline at uh, two minutes of just resting. And then we administer a stressor. So that's either, you know, as in this case, we ask the mum to freeze for two minutes, the still face paradigm, um, or uh, we do something like a toy removal task where you let them play with the toy during the baseline period and then you take it away from them, but hold it in view. Yeah, you keep that going. And then after two minutes, you have your recovery period. Okay. Uh, so basic, our basic model for how this works is, uh, you know, I, I've got my own levels of arousal, my autonomic arousal. I have a stressor that comes from outside that increases my arousal. And I use my kind of executive processes, you know, according to people like Posner and Rothbart, uh, I use my executive processes to downregulate my arousal uh, to recover. OK, so. What I'm gonna try and persuade you from this talk is uh, self-regulation when we measure it in real world settings looks very, very different to how we study it in the lab. Rather than thinking about how quickly do we calm down following an external stress stressor, I'm gonna be encouraging you to think instead of, about the stability of different arousal states. So a very, very different way of thinking about self-regulation, yeah? I'm gonna be talking about how both high and low self-arousal states may not be self-regulated, but in fact, the opposite. They may self-sustain. So we become dysregulated through our interactions with the environment. Yeah, And I'm going to be talking about how vocalizations and child caregiver arousal coupling can drive both regulation and dysregulation. So, so to start with it, I'm going to think, ask you to think about the differences between that lab version of the toy removal task and the same thing happening in the real world. Yeah. So remember, in the lab version, it's two minutes of baseline, then a stopwatch, two minutes of toy removal, and then a stopwatch, then two minutes of giving it back. OK, so how's that different to when the same thing happens, um, as happens to me quite regularly now? I'm the parent of a three year old called Freddie. Um, so what happens when a two with a real world toy removal episode uh, with Freddie? OK, so say, for example, we're out shopping. Yeah. Uh, so when you're out shopping, it's very stimulating. There's a lot of noises, a lot of unusual noises, a lot of people around. The child's very out of control because they're generally getting dragged from one shop to another. So that increases their stress. So that changes how uh, Freddie interacts with things. He becomes more inflexible when he's stressed. Um, um, and rather than you know saying, oh, I like that. Can I have that, daddy? He'll just grab a toy off the shelf um, and, uh, play, and uh, say, I want to have this. Yeah. So he started this episode. Yeah. I am also in a hurry, probably, uh, rather than, you know, stopping and having a conversation with him, helping him to calm down, to become more flexible. I'll just take the toy off him and say, no, we haven't got time for that, uh, which will then increase his stress still further. Yeah, then we might have a push pull where he's trying to keep hold of the toy. You know, that will increase his stress still further. He might let go of the toy suddenly and sit down with a bump, start crying. That will increase his stress. People in the shop might turn around and look at him. That will increase his stress still further. I'll get cross, drag him out of the shop and so on and so on. Okay. So what are the differences between this real world toy removal as any parent of any toddler would recognize it? Yeah. And the lab version. OK, so the lab version is passive. Yeah. The child doesn't trigger any of the events that actually happen in the lab version. Yeah. It's all done off a stopwatch by an experimenter. Yeah. Whereas the real world version is interactive. Yeah. Freddie started off that episode and has had a role in contributing to all of the different individual things that happen that come on top of this original stressor. Yeah. And that's actually the second big difference. Yeah. Whereas we've got one stressor in the first one, we've got the chain reaction of cascades. Yeah. One thing causes something else, which causes something else, which causes something else. Yeah. So these are some really fundamental differences between uh, real world self-regulation and the lab version. OK, so how can we measure self-regulation more like how we measure it in real world settings? OK, so I've been doing a lot of work um, on this over recent years, uh, funded by uh, the Economic and Social Research Council UK and by the European Research Council. And we're basically designing these little um, uh, monitors. Uh, so a little video camera, a little microphone, little heart rate monitor, 
um, actigraphy, movement patterns, GPS, uh, parent-child proximity, uh, and we put it on the baby and we put it on the mum. A uh, researcher goes to their home at the start of the day, uh, puts the kit on both the parent and uh, the child and, and the, and the mum, uh, and then returns at the end of the day to pick it up. And we get a random sample of a day in the life of everything that the parent and the mum have seen and heard and how their stress levels fluctuated, so their physiological stress. Okay. Uh, so uh, for what I'm going to be saying now, um, I've defined um, autonomic nervous system activity um, uh, from measuring a composite of heart rate, heart rate variability and movement. So we're treating it as a one dimensional construct from highly aroused. So that's high sympathetic fight or flight nervous system to, to low arousal. So that's high par parasympathetic rest and digest. Yeah. I know that there are various problems with treating it as a one dimensional construct. Basically, you know, it's something that it can be seen both as one dimension and as multiple separable sub factors. Um, but there are some papers here uh, that I've linked to um, specifically on that question uh, and just email me if you've got any questions about that. So autonomic arousal for now is one dimension from aroused to not aroused. OK, so. Rather than uh, thinking about self-regulation um, in this idea of, of, of um, uh, you know, an external stressor coming in and we have to control it, yeah? When we think about self-regulation in real world settings, yeah? We're thinking about allostasis, yeah? We know that um, optimal arousal, so optimal cognitive function happens when we're somewhere between over-aroused, you know, running around, bouncing off the walls and hypo-aroused, you know, sitting there feeling drowsy, falling asleep, yeah? So our best cognitive performance happens somewhere in the middle, yeah? And basically allostasis is basically the active process uh, that we use uh, to maintain ourselves in this optimal intermediate state, yeah? So in response to increases in arousal, I modulate my behaviors to decrease arousal. In, a mod in response to decreases in arousal, I modulate my behaviors to increase arousal, yeah? So that is what, you know, we would expect to find, you know, when we're thinking about self-regulation uh, in a real world setting, yeah? Um, so I'm gonna be talking now about uh, how vocalizations and, and, and child caregiver arousal, first of all, how they can drive self-regulation so that's allostasis so that's helping me to maintain in the arousal state that i want to be in yeah and then we're going to go on to talk a little bit about the end of the opposite yeah how they can actually also drive dysregulation so that they can actually drive me out of the state that i want to be in as well yeah but first of all we're going to be talking about self-regulation okay so this is from some data that we took uh, from uh, looking at the baby's autonomic arousal as i defined it um, and their infant's vocal behaviors during the course of the day yeah and basically, if you cut out all of the times when the baby did a vocalization, yeah, and you cut out their arousal around it, yeah, so how that vocalization changes around it, and then we look at the difference between um, how their arousal changed around cries and around speech-like vocalizations, so these are 12-month-old infants, um, then this is what the graph looks like. So both types of vocalization have an increase in arousal yeah around the vocalization which is really important we think i'm not going to be talking much about that today but we talk about a lot about that in this paper here yeah um arousal level at the time of the cry at the time of the vocalization is slightly higher for cries than for speech lines but not by much yeah um and then uh, the other thing that I want to draw your attention to on this graph is, in fact, this thing which might be quite counterintuitive, yeah, which is actually following a cry, they have a faster fall off in arousal than they do following a speech-like vocalization, yeah? So you get a peak in arousal, a higher peak around a cry, but then uh, arousal falls off faster uh, following it, yeah? Might seem funny to you, uh, but in fact, when we look more into the detail, this is because cries elicit down-regulation via co-regulation, yeah? So when the baby does a cry the mother changes her behaviors to help the baby to calm down yeah so if we do the same things looking firstly at infant arousal stability yeah so we know that babies show increased arousal stability before cries and then if we look at the caregivers arousal yeah so how the caregivers arousal changes around cries we show that they actually show the opposite pattern they show an increase in their arousal stability following infant cries yeah and we also show increased infant caregiver arousal coupling follow cries yeah so this is, we think, you know, the caregiver um, kind of engaging in co-regulation to help the child calm down, which is why they calm down quickly following a cry, yeah? So this is uh, one half of allostasis in response to increases in arousal. I modulate by behaviors to decrease arousal, yeah? What about the other? Can we see behaviors uh, that are consistent with the other? Okay. So if we go back um, to, uh, in fact, I won't say that. Um, so uh, one paper that we're working on at the moment is uh, we, 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 as well as measuring this home data, yeah, we also took the same dyads into the lab, 
and and we measured using a traditional test of self-regulation very like the, the one that i started with yeah this was actually a still face protocol and we split our group between those that are good at self-regulating in the lab setting yeah and those that aren't so good those that get more upset um, um during this kind of experimental stressor yeah and then we looked at how their behaviors in home settings were different okay so the various different ways uh, that I'm just writing up at the moment that too, 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 take too long to explain now, uh, suggesting that consistent with this idea that, that babies with better self-regulation are actually better at upregulating their arousal when they're under aroused as well. Yeah, It's not all about downregulating, but you have to believe me for that. I haven't got time to talk about these now because I want to just focus on these speech-like vocalizations. Yeah. So if they're using cries to downregulate arousal, then we're interested in asking whether they're using speech-like vocalizations to upregulate arousal. Yeah. And in fact, this graph isn't um, symmetric. Uh, sorry, this graph is symmetric around the time zero line. This is for all babies. Yeah. But what's really interesting is when you split it between the good self-regulators and the less good self-regulators. So this is the graph for cries first. Yeah. So we get faster downregulation um, following uh, via co-regulation following cries in the low self-regulation group. So, so this was the graph, the spiky graph, red graph is the whole group. Yeah, that's cries for the whole red group. Yeah. But when we split this, uh, the red graph into the low self-regulation group and the high self-regulation group, in fact, we show that this pattern is much more marked for the low self-regulation group. So they're getting much more co-regulation following a cry than the high self-regulation group are. Yeah. And then when we look at speech-like vocalizations, we get kind of the opposite pattern, yeah? It's flatter for the low self-regulation group, but we get this really marked pattern that the high self-regulation group shows sustained increases in arousal uh, following cries more than the so low self-regulation group, yeah? So this is speech-like vocalizations leading to increases in arousal in the high self-regulation group, yeah? So uh, we think uh, that this is evidence for both sides of the allostatic mechanism potentially, yeah? So we're showing that cry. So when I over aroused, I do a cry and that elicits down regulation via co-regulation with my caregiver. Yeah. But then when I want to increase things, I do a speech like vocalization and that elicits up regulation of arousal. Yeah. Both of these happen via caregiver engagement. OK, so there's a ton more stuff uh, that we can do to look at these types of things uh, that I can tell you about uh, later. Yeah. I just right at the end of the talk now, I want to talk a little bit about the opposite. Yeah. So we've been talking about vocal behaviors driving self-regulation. Yeah. What about dysregulation? OK, so. We think this happens quite a lot. Yeah. Um, and we think this because of a paper uh, that, that, that um, I've done, which is that if we assume if we look at just how arousal uh, levels change during the day. Yeah. And we look at this idea that allostasis should be the high and low arousal states are corrected for, whereas intermediate states aren't. Yeah. Then when we look at how the stability of arousal changes as a function of my arousal level. Yeah. Uh, we get we, we would predict to get a prediction like this. Yeah. When I'm at intermediate arousal, my arousal is more likely to be stable to the next time. And when I'm at high or low arousal, I'm less likely to be stable because I'm more likely to be using allostasis. Yeah, that's a kind of naive prediction, but it does make sense. OK, in fact, the graph you get when you plot this is exactly the opposite. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so the red is the exact actual observed data, and we find that intermediate arousal states are more unstable. Yeah, they're more like they're less likely to be at that same state at the next epoch, and high and low arousal states are more likely to be at the same state to the next epoch. Yeah, so both high and low arousal states are more long-lasting than intermediate arousal states, and they're also more long-lasting than expected by chance. Yeah, so this is our control data going along at chance. Okay, so. This is high arousal, low, low arousal states are sticky. Yeah, they last longer than intermediate arousal states and they last longer than expected by chance. OK, so this could be because high and low arousal states have this property called hysteresis. So this is basically the stability of a system. Yeah, so physics, physics use this to, to talk about how stable a state is. Yeah, so sleep. Um, is it is an intrinsically stable arousal state? I forgot to say that we excluded sleeping sleeping um, um, sections from these data, uh, but it could be a similar thing that when I'm in a calm state, that's just a more stable state, yeah. Or it could be because high or low arousal states cause self-reinforcing stress cycles. Yeah, this is what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so remember that real world version, yeah. So we talked about how one thing triggers something else, which triggers something else, which triggers something else. So this is this idea of dyadic dysregulation. So uh, how uh, an increase in child arousal. So this is my Freddie uh, when he was out shopping, being stressed, causes him to interact differently with me. 
uh, because he's more stressed, more flexible. That causes a change in my behavior because he's interacting differently, which causes me to interact differently with him, which then in turn causes a further increase in uh, child arousal. So this is how you get these self-reinforcing, you know, positive cycles. Yeah. So this is why uh, we think uh, what might be one mechanism why uh, these high arousal states last longer than the child. Yeah. And in fact, actually, funny enough, the same idea of these self-reinforcing cycles, yeah, also might potentially explain why low arousal states also last longer than expected by child, yeah, in a different way. So you get a decrease in child arousal, leading to an increase in their ability to engage with objects around them, which is then shared again across the dyad in a different way uh, through, for example, an increase in child, you know, object directed vocalizations, how much the caregiver comes and chats to the, the child about what they're doing, which then in further increases the child's engagement. And then you get this kind of a, you know, a positive self-reinforcing stress cycle. Yeah. So this is basically what I think is going on here. Uh, you know, you have uh, your mechanisms, your, your states of interaction. Yeah. Sometimes you're using allostasis. So sometimes when I'm over aroused, I'll cry and elicit caregiver down regulation and that, 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 that fits me. But sometimes I'll get into a cycle, you know, a reinforcing cycle, yeah, which can either trap me in a high arousal state or it can trap me in a low arousal state. Yeah? So that's kind of basically what I think is going on. OK, so just to say what I've said. Self-regulation in the real world settings looks very different to how we study it in the lab. Rather than thinking about how quickly we calm down following an external stressor, I've been thinking about the stability. Um, I've been asking you to think about the stability of different arousal states, talking about how both high and low arousal states might self-sustain through our interactions with the environment. Um, and we've been talking about how vocalizations and childgiver caregiver arousal coupling can drive both regulation and dysregulation. If you want to find out more, then you can uh, follow me on Twitter or on Instagram, uh, where I'm posting lots about these uh, things at the moment. Uh, or you can email me or you can read one of these papers.